sorry. All right. It's a uh, voice is not. Welcome. Hello, check. Hmm. Mic is on. All right. Welcome back, everyone, to our second lecture, BC213. Um, just want to see if audio is okay. Can you? Yeah, it's okay. Okay. All right. There's a question in the chat. Um, from Nina Matt, about Matthew 7:21, the people who prophesy cast out demons would be would be referring to those who do not consistently bear fruit. How do we categorize them? Yeah, so uh, Nina, if you look very carefully at uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, we see two main things that the Lord Jesus points to. Right, first, He says they did not do the will of the Father. Second, he said, I never knew you. That means they had no relationship with Jesus. So they were just doing these things, using the name of Jesus and even you know, doing supernatural things. But it was not coming from a relationship with the Lord. So what do you mean? Well, then they had a relationship with the devil, right? But they were operating in this domain they were operating in the Christ, in and through the church but their relationship was not with the lord they were demonically empowered then you see what why would they use the name of jesus that is the whole purpose of deception deception is you're coming in this manner doing what people think is genuine but really you're being led people leading people away from the lord so they had no relationship with Jesus. They were not doing what God, what the Father's will is. And therefore, Jesus called all that they did as sin, lawlessness. So that's the real thing, right? These are not people who have a relationship with Jesus. They're doing their own bidding. They're operating out of some other power, not the name of the, not the Lord himself. And... Uh, that's what causes deception. I hope I answered your question. Okay, so let's go back now to talking about the rapture. Why do we say that there is a pre-tribulation rapture of the church? We're looking at the first reason, which we saw in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. So Paul is saying, concerning our gathering together to him, there is something that's, that the man of sin must be revealed, but there's something holding him back. He's, he's using the word he now in verse 7. Now the, he, the word he is capitalized, but actually you'll see a footnote that says it's actually small he. That means it should not have been capitalized. Okay, It's just a normal pronoun. And it shouldn't, it does not require to be capitalized. Capitalized means we do refer to God. But actually it should not have been. It's it can be just it just general he. So what I was saying was that this he refers to the church, not the Holy Spirit. Now, why do we say that? Well, because if so imagine if the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, leaves the earth then the man of sin is revealed son of perdition which we know he will have seven years on the earth we know that that means for this last seven years if holy spirit is not operating on the earth nobody can get saved because you cannot get saved without the holy spirit if any man have not the spirit of christ he is none of his we are born again by the spirit Nobody can do ministry. But the Bible says there are 144,000 Jews who will be preaching. The Bible says there are many souls who will be beheaded for the testimony of Jesus. And the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. That means the only way we can have give testimony to Jesus is because we have the Holy Spirit. The Bible also says there will be two witnesses, two prophets for three and a half years. 
they will be prophesying, doing mighty signs, God's prophets. If Holy Spirit is not here, how will the prophets function? Then Bible also says, in the end of time, Zechariah 12.10, there will be a great outpouring on the house of Israel, of the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit is not there, where will be the outpouring? So, looking at all this, and I've mentioned these here, it is correct, biblically, to say Holy Spirit is still working on the earth during the tribulation. He's still working. He hasn't gone yet, left yet. And we can, like I said, we, we can see all of this in Scripture. So, if the Holy Spirit is continuing to work on the earth, then the He, therefore, is the church. And in the context of this, verse 1 says, Brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord and our gathering together to Him. Hmm. Our gathering together unto Him. So in that context, only when He who is restraining is taken out of the way, then the Antichrist will be revealed. So, okay. In that context, it is safe. he's already said, what is he talking about? Our gathering together to him. So he who now restrains has to be taken out of the way. Who is he? At least two things he's mentioned. First Thessalonians chapter 4, he has described in detail how believers are being caught up. Again, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1, our gathering together unto him, he is taken out of the way. So it has to be the church. Is one reason. Okay. So, uh, and I've mentioned all of this here you know, on page 58, all these, you know, the fact that the Holy Spirit will be uh, working on the earth. I've given you the references. Right. The second reason is what we said that the promise to the church. You know, both the church in uh, Thessalonica, that is uh, uh, Thessalonians, and also the promise to the church in Revelation. So if you look at the promise, what did Jesus or Paul write to the church? In First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9 to 11, this is on page 58. He said, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. The word wrath can be understood as judgment, wrath, old English word, meaning judgment. God did not appoint us for judgment. The context, chapter 5, verses 1 to 8, is about the coming of the Lord Jesus, for us to be ready for His coming. So it says, in that context, understand, God didn't, don't be scared that you're going to miss, because God's plan is not for us to go through the wrath that is going to come on the earth. That is not God's plan. Okay, so he's told the believers, believers, we are not going to go through the wrath. So don't get worried that you'll miss the rapture. You just be ready, live the live right, and know that God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Similarly, number three, we see the same thing in the church in Revelation. In uh, Revelation three, ten to eleven, the church in the church. Three, ten to eleven. Yeah, the church in Philadelphia. Yeah. He says, "But you have kept my revelation three ten. You kept my command to persevere. I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test all who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have." So he's telling the believers. And because you've persevered, I will keep you from the hour of trial, which will come on the whole world. Okay. Now, of course, again, people here will discuss, okay, what is this trial is referring to? That's all something happened nearby, something happened there. So there are a lot of 
you know, a lot of explanations people give. My, my thing is just simple. The book of Revelation is given to describe this trial which will come on the whole earth. The book is given. So basically from chapter 6 to chapter 20. It's describing the trial that comes on the whole earth. So then this is the book. The whole book is about that. So in my understanding, what the Lord is speaking to the church, he's saying, look, I'll keep you from all certain Some people say, no, 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 Jesus, I think of some problem, this church will fix. But then that will not be a trial that comes on the whole earth. He said, I will keep you from the trial that is coming upon your city, or coming upon you. But I will keep you from the trial that will come on the whole. The only trial that we know which will come on the whole earth is what is given to us in the book of whole earth. So, again, Revelation 3, 10 and 11, um, it's he said, I will keep you from this. The so word keep you from it means I'll take you out of. I'll not keep you in and through, but I'll keep you out and away from. That's the meaning of ek and evacuation. Number four is the typology used in Matthew 24, which we also read earlier in Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, after Jesus gives the signs of the end times, he says, as in the days of Noah, so will it be at the time of the coming of the Son of Man. Matthew 24, we're looking at verses 36 to 39. Matthew 24, 36 to 39, is saying that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of the Father, but well, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also the coming of the Son of Man be. But as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So the thing is, Jesus says the, the coming of the Son of Man will be like this. And he's talking about the Noah and the ark. So what happened? Please do Noah and the ark. Noah was preaching. And he was building the ark. He was laughing at them. What ark you building? You've never seen rain. What are you saying? There's flood coming. You don't know flood is coming. Be ready. Repent. No, the preacher rains. There's nobody there. Build the ark. He got the Noah. Get inside. And he said, the ark. Then judgment came. After the judgment over, we are released back on the earth. So it's a type of how the church is taken out of the world, out of the world, into a place of safety. Judgment is poured out on the earth. After that, the church is brought back. So because of the typology used. The people were taken out, then the judgment came. Judgment over, then they were released back on the first again. We say, okay, and that's what James would have to do. Then it's a beautiful picture of the rapture of the church. The church is taken out to a place of safety, and there is judgment being poured out on the earth. And after the judgment is over, they are brought back. Um, two more points. Number five is a chronology of the book of Revelation. And we will explain this uh, when we begin uh, a quick overview of Revelation, which we will be doing. Uh, and then next year we we'll get into it chapter and verse detail. But let me mention this that. When we study the book of Revelation, 
the first three chapters, God tells John, John, write the things which are, or which you have seen, things which are, and things which are yet to come. So there are three parts to the book of Revelation. Things that you have seen, things that are, the next thing that were happening in 1980, at the time John was having the Revelation, and things that are yet to come, the next thing that are out in the future. So the book of Revelation can be divided into three parts. Things that you have seen, that is chapter one. Things that are, that is chapters two and three. There are seven churches. They were there in at that time. Things that are. Things that are yet to come. That was all to end. Till the end. Things that are in the future. Chapter one, things you have seen. Chapters 2 and 3, things that are. Chapters 4 to end. And two, things in the future. Understood? Not understood. So, 4 and 5 are talking about things that are in the future. Because chapter 4 begins by saying, John, come up here and I will show you things which must get things that are to come. But some chapter 4 begins. That means everything from there, chapter 4, verse 1, is in the future. Yeah, look at that. Revelation. Chapter 4. Chapter 4. Verse 1. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking to me, saying, Come up here. And I will show you things which must take place after. And then these things are going to take place. They're in the future. And what do we see in chapter 4 and 5? We will study this in detail later and uh, in, in, in earlier. But in chapter 4 and 5, we see there will come a time in the future that the saints will be in the presence of God. They would have received their rewards. They are wearing white robes. They are worshiping. And then the scroll is opened. That means this opening of the scroll representing that it is time for the fulfillment of those prophecies to begin. Okay. So chapters 4 and 5 are in the future. And what do we see in chapter 4 and 5? First, we see the saints are in heaven. They are worshipping God. The elders are seated. They have their crowns. They have received their rewards. And then scrolls open. And the seven years of tribulation begin. So, even in the chronology of the book of Revelation, the first picture of things to come is the saints are in heaven worshiping God, having received the rewards that got their crowns, and they are worshiping God. After that, the scroll is open, which is then the seven years of tribulation begin. Understand? I'll repeat it. Repeat it many times. What the question? Uh, so, Pastor, like uh, we said, like chapter four and chapter five were things that need to happen, like which are not happened, right? They must come place. But in chapter five, uh, chapter five, verse one, then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne uh, on a scroll. So right side of him, uh, one person is sitting and we uh, know that Jesus sat on the right side of God. So if this is to happen, then how we can say like Jesus has already sat? So, no, Jesus right now is at the right hand of the Father. See this then. But chapter 5 is the beginning of the seven years of tribulation. So what happened? What, what do we see in chapter five? We see in the throne room. 
and they see the scroll and they say who's worthy who's fit to open the scroll that means who can say it, let this start who has the authority to you know like it's like give a much or to you know bring the bell that these things this proposition is what is the authority so nobody is there then they see one the land of God and he is given the scroll and he opens the scroll that means only Jesus has been given the authority to say time has come for these prophecies to be and then chapter 6 starts that means all the tribulation studies from chapter 6 were part the seals are open next. so what we see in chapter 5 is going to happen right now Jesus seated the right hand of father uh, worship is going on all that but 4 and 5 is going to happen when believers will come there will be there, they will receive the crown, the elders will be seated. Um, and the uh, will be standing with their robes of righteousness, their crowns, worshiping God, and then the scroll will be That is to come. You read chapter 4, by this. And the last point, why we say the rapture is going to come. Is Daniel 7 clear? Okay. So the angel Gabriel had come and prophesied and given this word to Daniel. Daniel, I'm going to tell you about 70 weeks. That's 70 weeks. Okay. Daniel chapter 9, 24 and 27. There will be 69 weeks. 62 plus 7 is 69. 69 weeks. From the time the decree is given to go and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah is cut off, until Messiah is crucified. For 483 years finished, only seven years left. That is referred to as Daniel's 70th week. And this 70th week is when the Antichrist will be operating on the earth. This man is Daniel 9 27. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Page 61. He will confirm a covenant with many for one week. One week is seven years. So this Antichrist will come as a man of peace. He will set up a treaty of peace for seven years. One week, seven years. But in the middle of the week, he will stop everything. Okay. So Daniel 70th week is concerning Jerusalem, concerning Israel. But the Antichrist will remain. So it's not about the church. The church is taken out of the it's about them and what will happen. In the seven years, it's about the nations coming against Israel. It's the Antichrist doing his thing. And the focus is on persecuting Israel and those who have the testimony of Jesus. So Daniel 17th week is about Jerusalem and Israel. So the church is taken out of the way. Um, not the yeah. So let me pause here. Let me take this. So there's a question there on the um, um you know on on, on the on the chat. Yes, yeah, so just to paraphrase the church referred to as the bride. Yeah. So in the New Testament, the church is referred to with many different pictures as we mentioned. One of them is the bride. The church is the bride, which doesn't mean the church is a lady, it's just a picture of the church to represent Christ's relationship to the church. But the church is also referred to as uh, branches on the vine. The church is also referred to as um, the candlestick. There's been a there's literally a candlestick because the representing the picture of what the church is. The church is also referred to as um, uh, a house of God, a house of prayer and worship, and so on. So similarly, the church is also referred to as the body of Christ. The body of Christ is masculine, right? So he, the, the, the pronoun she can be used for the church just as much as the pronouns and the use of the church. Both are fine. We are so used to the church being the bride, she, 
Because that's the picture that's often the Trinity. But we also think church is the body of Christ, which means we should we can say he for the church. We can use that uh, the main pronoun, he for the church, because it's the body of Christ, masculine. Yeah. I hope that helps. So essentially the church is neutral, it's just the gathering of all believers. Right. Um, next question, Second Thessalonians 2 1 is talking about the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together to Him. So it's talking about one event as described in First Thessalonians 4 13 to 18. First Thessalonians 4 13 to 18, the Lord is coming and we are gathered together to Him. Right. So that's the context in which Paul is writing Second Thessalonians 2 verse 1. The coming of the Lord and our gathering together to him, which he has very clearly described in First Thessalonians chapter 4, 18, 18. That's what you're talking to. So one event, one happening uh, as described by okay. Paul. Any other questions? Um, reference by reference meaning verse by verse. A book of Revelation, Daniel, yeah. Let's go verse by verse. It's getting deeper and deeper. So many questions. You can ask, ask your questions. Are they here? Read the scriptures. <laughs> yeah. I said, like, this is how about the best like, you know, we are considering like, um, as a picture. Yes. So, uh, like, um, what you said also, like, we mostly aware of, aware, like, a bright, this picture only, mostly we consider. And uh, when when people are writing a songs, like, like, a bride and he is our groom, like I, I can refer to some uh, one situation which happened recently like uh one lady wrote a song on like it's in telugu mm. uh, like pre ralu means it's it's bride pre means it's uh groom mm. so he, she literally wrote a song which it's like a like one one girl writing to her boyfriend mm. writing a song to her boyfriend and she wrote she wrote as a christian song and she took everything into a literal uh, words, like completely writing a girl to her boyfriend. And and it was bullied like nothing in the social media. And it, it created a, I mean, there is a lot of uh, people who spoke a bit against Jesus Christ and about the Christianity. And how, how we can take these things, can we, can we take it completely literal words. So we should be careful. So, see, God has given, or God has used, uh, let me say, the Bible uses images from our worlds to convey something about his relationship with us. So one of the pictures is that of the brides. Yeah, uh, so bright. But we must not take everything that the bride represents to reflect on our relationship with the Lord. Right? So as bride, yeah, we keep ourselves holy, we keep ourselves set apart for the Lord. Uh, so the bride does makeup, we also have to do makeup, the bride does this and that. No, that is not that is not how he meant it, right? He just saying that that's how the relationship with us he cares for us in that manner but don't take it into all the literal things you know so that's where we go wrong and so one big thing like you mentioned people take the um the book of song of solomon to say oh this is talking about christ and the church my response is my my response is no it is not it's a Song of Solomon, it's a book about Solomon and his earthly love. And God has put that there to talk about human love. So don't allegorize it and say it's talking about Christ and the church. Because then a lot of messes happen. 
But a lot of big preachers use Song of Solomon to talk about Christ and the church. Big, big books have been written about it. But I think that's allegorizing. That's not the original intent of the book of Song of Solomon. It's just talking about human love. Leave it like that. Don't be embarrassed. It's there. Why suddenly become spiritual? No, no. Leave it there. <laughs> it's talking about human love. Right? So, it's not. Nowhere. There's no reference. No reference neither in the New Testament. See, one clear way of interpreting scripture is there's a New Testament point back. And you nowhere, nobody in the New Testament refers to the Song of Solomon in the context of Christ and the church. Nothing. At least if Jesus had done it or Paul had done it, I'm sure they all read it. But not one of them said that is representing Christ and the church. So we don't have the right to allegorize it. You shouldn't. But so many people do it. And then it gives a very bad taste. Because from there they go and writing all these songs and <laughs> full confusion happens. So I think it's it's a mistake and it's not right. Any other questions? Yes, Pastor. Uh, we are uh, looking about the rapture of the church, and yes. we studied about uh, Matthew chapter twenty-four, where Jesus talks about signs yes. and what. And then in Matthew chapter twenty-five, he talks about ten virgins, the parable of ten virgins, and also the parable of talents. Yes. And uh, like my question is, the of ten virgins have anything in uh, context of? Rapture, because most of the times uh, people use this story, uh, like this parable, to explain about the rapture that how a bride should be ready. If we are not ready and we don't have oil, we'll be left out. So, this has anything to do with rapture in context? The answer is yes. Both. So, the, in, in chapter 25, Matthew 25. There are two main parables. One is the parable of the ten virgins and the parable of the talents. Both are there. And both are given in the context of what he has previously spoken, which is be ready for the coming of the Lord. Right? So he says, this is how you have to be ready. So in the parable of the ten virgins, he the, the main thing is they didn't have enough oil. They didn't have what it took to tarry until the bridegroom came because it says the bridegroom tarried or bridegroom was delayed that means uh, he so the, the the story is he got delayed but you didn't have enough to wait for him that is the message now if we allegorize it which is not the intent of the story oh they Oil represents the Holy Spirit. The lantern represents your local church. Whatever, whatever. You know, from there he allegories. Well, that is not what he's saying. He just didn't say that. What was his message? Message is, you have to have what it takes to endure, to be there until the Lord returns, even if it seems like he is delayed. That's the message. So five of the virgins didn't come. They didn't have enough to wait. They quit. They had to go do something. So they missed the coming of the Lord. So is that what we have this in terms of falling away of the world? Can we say that? Like yeah. Okay? Yeah, we can connect that in the sense that there is going to be a falling away. In this case, they fell away because they didn't have what it took to stay the course until the bridegroom came. Uh, but we shouldn't say, like, if you're going shopping in the mall, you're falling away. And all that. No, no, <laughs> no, they went to buy oil. That is the, the illustration. But the message is they didn't have enough to stay until he quit. Then about the talents, until the Lord comes, you be faithful in using what he has given you. Keep multiplying it until he comes. Don't sit and just do nothing with what he has given. In other words, be busy. With what he has given you till he comes. That's the main message of the parable of the talents. So 
it's all in the context of the coming of the Lord, but this is what you do. Um, and we should just leave it at that. We shouldn't, you know, um, allegorize things, like adding to the meaning of what was not intended. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, so we have given six reasons why we are saying the rapture of the church will take place before the seven years of tribulation. Okay. And uh, you think about these reasons, right? Uh, the, the main thing we said was about Second Thessalonians 2. He will be taken out of the way, then the man of sin will be revealed. He said about the promise to the church in Thessalonica in Revelation. Then we talk about the typology that Jesus used in Matthew 24, Noah's Ark. Uh, we also uh, talk about the, um, the chronology of the book of Revelation. Like, okay, it's happening like this, we stay with it. Now, people may say, no, 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 they'll, they'll jumble up the book of Revelation. All that. From my perspective is, hey, Jesus was going, telling John, John, I will show you things to come. So obviously he's giving it to him in a sequence. And in between, he may make references to things of the past. Like we will see, Revelation 12, he will talk about things of the past or you know so on. But he's giving it in a sequence. We'll stay with the sequence. Don't jumble it up here and there. Stay with that. So in the beginning of it, chapters 4 and 5 is saints in heaven. And then Daniel's 70th week, that is mainly meant for uh, Jerusalem and Israel. Okay. Uh, any questions from anyone? Go ahead, go ahead. This thing must take place, but actually, he's also telling something that has already happened. Like, for saints, already or critical crown, it's already happened. It's not something that's going to happen. So, chapter 4 and 5 are events that are going to happen, but in heaven right now, we know there is worship happening. Right? It means. Uh, because we see throughout the Old Testament, right, that there's worship in heaven. There are a, uh, worshiping angels. And when we go to heaven, yeah, we're not going to sit there and say, okay, music is not started, I will worship you later. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> we are going to be worshiping. So is worship going on in heaven right now? Yes. There are angels, I'm sure all the believers who have gone up, are worshiping the Lord. But specifically, the description of chapters 4 and 5 in Revelation is about things going to happen. That means there's coming a time when there will be 24 elders seated around the throne. Who are the 24 elders? We will talk about it. 12 of them are most likely Old Testament saints. Saints of the Old Testament. The other 12 are most likely the 12 apostles. The reason we can say that is because when John was writing, John was still not dead. That means the 12 apostles are not seated there. John, at least one is, one is here on earth. So if there are 24 elders and we're saying 12 of them are the apostles, wait, one apostle is here. Therefore, that setting is not current. It's not at that time. It's in the future. Now, why we say 12 of them are the 12 apostles? Because two reasons. In Matthew 20, Jesus, when you know James and John, their mother came and asked, can you make sure my son sit on your right? And he said, you know, that is up to my father. But yes, they can have it. Like they can participate of what I'm going through. So it seemed like he, they would be the 12 apostles. The other reason is because in Revelation chapter 21, the foundations of the city of Jerusalem, the 12 apostles are there. You know, the 12. So if they're given that much importance, then definitely they would be seating, you know, there'll be the 12 apostles. The reason we're saying the other 12 are the Old Testament saints is because in Revelation 20, 
yeah, 20, I think, or 21. When John is talking to one of the elders, he says, I am of your brethren. That means the Jewish brethren. Hmm. So uh, he is revealing himself that one of the elders is uh, of your brethren. So let me give you the exact verse. Yeah, verse 9, 22, 9. Then he said to me, Revelation 22, 9, Then he said to me, See that you do not wish do that, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren the prophets of those who keep the words of this book worship God. So John is talking to the elder. He falls down to worship him. He says, Hey, Matkarubaya, don't do it. <laughs> because I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren the prophets. So, prophets means Old Testament. So that means one of them is Old Testament prophet. So that's why he's saying, hey, one of them is then most likely the other remaining are Old Testament prophets. Twelve of them are Old Testament prophets. Twelve of them are apostles of the Lamb. But it cannot be a picture happening that time because John is still here on the earth. Okay? So it's going to be in the future. And uh, then they're all wearing crowns, which means they would have received rewards. That means the reward ceremony has happened. But the reward ceremony will happen only when all of us are there. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Right? Because they're having their crowns and they're falling down, they're worshipping with their crowns on the ground. So that's what we're saying that the first scene, chapter 4, is right after the award ceremony. All the believers are in heaven. Everybody has received their awards. The Old Testament prophets and the 12 apostles have been given their crowns. They are given their places and everybody is worshipping. So that's the rapture should have taken place for all the believers to be there for that to happen. <laughs> uh, I've, I've repeatedly heard from different pastors like there will be a reward for the number of souls and 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 God will give a throne on it the number of souls we we earn the number of diamonds will be there on our crown I know earning good motivation <laughs> but the Bible does say in Daniel 12, he who wins souls is wise. Hmm. I'll give you the exact verse. So Gabriel is telling to Daniel, um, uh, verse uh, 3, Daniel 12, 3. No? He says, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. Those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. It means if you uh, turn people to righteousness, you're bringing them to the Lord, you'll shine like the stars. You know, So that is what he's saying. You know? But whether how, how bright you shine, <laughs> how much light you give, or <laughs> that, no, I don't know. He's just saying like, if you, if you win many to righteousness, you will shine. What does it mean? Those or those who win souls, they'll have many stars or something like that. And the other thing, Pastor, it refers to the translation. Yeah, I'm not sure whether the, you know, uh, in translation, whether people have by mistake brought in a different idea. Uh, okay, let's close. Um, please go back to these six points, think about it, uh, look up the scriptures. Study it. If it's not clear, please bring up questions next class.
Um, we will be talking about these things again uh, uh, when we go through Revelation and also next year when we go through Daniel and Revelation in detail. Okay. Uh, let's can somebody close in prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for all the last word, Lord, and thank you for Pastor Ashish, Lord. Thank you for teaching us many things, oh Lord. Help us to learn clearly and study your word, and Lord, and help us to be a uh, people who glorifies you to taking all, all the word and preaching, oh Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.